afternoon. This is Bill Alderson. <clears throat> hey, I appreciate you joining us this afternoon for um, just about 30 minutes or so as we just talk about six things that you can do. Uh, in many years of uh, performing critical problem resolution, you know, when, when nobody else was able to solve it and high stakes, um, you know, situation, high complexity, lots of people um, waiting for you to fix the problem type of thing, you know, my <coughs> mind always goes to the end of the engagement when Everybody stands around and says, oh, that, that was a pretty simple solution. And typically, you know, there's multiple things that go wrong in a, in a crisis or a critical problem. But when you go back and, and reconstruct or do the anatomy of a critical problem, you always find that the root cause is, you know, some uh, technical problem, of course, typically, or configuration related or something of that nature. Um, but after we're done doing the critical problem resolution, everybody says, well, why did that occur? You know, was, how did that you know, problem get us to this debilitating point? And how can we prevent it in the future? So that's been my guiding light to help people, um, yes, go in and help them when they do have a problem. We, you know, we do that. But if I can obviate problems through best practices, the things that you can do to avoid a problem, that's much better than having a problem that you have to resolve. I think we'd all agree. And I'm going to talk a little bit about six of the things that you can do. Of course, there's hundreds of things that we can do, literally hundreds. There's best practices, there's ITIL, there's, you know, standards of various types, there's certifications of various types, there's all sorts of things that we can do. I can't remember all of them all the time, every single day. So I'm going to bring to you six of the things that you can do to avoid crisis, to avoid critical problems, to avoid problems in general. And so that's what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> um, this is uh, our website here on the top left. You'll see we've got a, a variety of services, and we've taken the Jefferson Memorial and we've used it and the pillars in the Jefferson Memorial to illustrate our services and the steps to illustrate other services and that sort of thing. And if if you have a chance sometime, you ought to hit that Start Here button on the front of our Appletics webpage and go through and just listen to, to see how the, the webpage works and that sort of thing and to look at our collaboration. Um, systemization model and that sort of thing. It's pretty cool. And over on the right, we've got CIO Tech and we've got Cincinnac.com. Cincinnac, of course, is, is the TCP three-way handshake, uh, and we talk about performance analysis and that sort of thing. And in CIO Tech, we talk about things that are of interest to the CIOs. So kind of a bit about us, a uh, little bit about me. I started as a communications engineer at Lockheed Missiles and Space Company. If you read Steve Jobs' book, uh, or not his book, but the by Walter Isaacson that just came out, which I highly recommend because it really does a job of explaining how Steve Jobs and his company and his problems and the adversities and that sort of thing drove this guy uh, to build some really excellent products that the market really loved. But in that book, he talks about how Lockheed, Fairchild, and the other companies in the Silicon Valley, that defense uh, money and the defense contracting that was in there actually spawned high-tech industry and chip building and that sort of thing. And, of course, I can remember when we did multi-layer boards over there and and wiping, and so um, that was kind of the beginning of printed circuits. And then they just kept getting smaller and smaller. I joined Work General in the mid '80s, uh, and uh, we started working on the on the uh, the sniffer. And when I really got into protocol analysis and critical problem resolution, it was uh, in '86, '87. Um, subsequently, I 
started Pont and Group. Some of you may know me from that. I created the uh, Sniffer training program. I licensed that to Network General, and they trained thousands of people. And and I also created the Certified Net Analyst program, and I trained uh, about 50,000 people in 22 countries, of whom we certified over 3,000 people as Certified Network Forensic Professionals. And during that time uh, in, in my career, I've uh, been able to provide service uh, training to 75% of the Fortune 100. So um, I've been around in a lot of various environments. Uh, I sold Pine Mountain Group to NetQOS, a uh, performance management company, in 2005, where I was a, one of their technology officers. And NetQOS sold out to CA Technologies in 2009. I hung out for a little longer than the founders did. They decided that uh, I had another company in me, and so I started Apex Corporation and uh, to help people solve problems and then learn from those problems to um, uh, provide and implement best practices so that we could obviate those problems. So here we are, six things we can do, six things that we can remember. And I put this under technical systemization. Now, technical systemization involves, you know, things going all the way back to the IETF and uh, the star FCs were not about, you know, how technology was going to work, but how we were going to collaborate to build the most um, important today technical source that we have, which is the Internet interconnecting all of us and providing a platform for business and uh, communities to develop across an electronic system. So, uh, you know, technical systemization is, you know, how you're going to collaborate. How are you going to, uh, you know, do all of these various things? And so I've taken what I believe to be the things that are should be utmost on your list of things to do to avoid crisis, and these are our uh, suite of IT best practices. First up, and it doesn't really matter which order they're in, but first up is decision support metrics. Now, people out there buying millions and probably billions of dollars worth of network management tools, analyzers, um, sorts of you know application agents and gizmos and gadgets aplenty to basically try to figure out what's wrong or to be notified about when things are going wrong and that sort of thing. But finding that even though we've spent an inordinate amount of money and an energy, that few people are really using the tools. So the experts, you know, today are the people or the proclaimed experts are the ones who Know, install it and keep it updated. Well, that is a, a very important part. You have to install the equipment and you have to keep it updated in the versions. And then you have to have users who can go in and connect and click and and get get the reports and that sort of thing. Finding that you know there's very few people who are truly doing analysis on these very expensive tools. They're um, if you're really looking at um, their enterprise, their environment, their applications, and the signatures of their applications, dependencies, and that sort of thing. So, you know, I call this decision support metrics because those metrics developed by, you know, operating system uh, details and monitoring tools and metrics. The SNMP, NetFlow, um, response time management, uh, performance management, uh, agent tools that are inside the actual platforms, cloud-based statistics, etc. You know, if you're not really looking at what your dependencies are and tuning those systems to look at your specific applications and your dependencies and doing some, and I'm going to talk a little bit about problem management later, but integrating that with problem management, finding out what problems are causing you issues the most, 
Uh, it's a very important thing to take and use those systems and turn them in uh, to decision support metrics. Decision support metrics means that there's actionable information in statistics. So you can tune your your pages and your systems to to go out and, and say, okay, I've got this application and we really need to serve the application owners here and we really monitor this application and when people have problems with it or there's capacity issues, we have the statistics and we have a baseline and watching each one of our major applications so that we we'll know what the next step is going to be. It's very important to do that. So here's some of the things with decision support metrics. You know, well, you've got the, the desktop, and then you've got the server. You've got all of the various components behind the server, which is, you know, the applications and the virtual platforms or the cloud platforms, the databases, the multi-tier capabilities, and you have to watch all of that. So you really need to architect around those sort of things. Look at those application data flow and dependencies. Now, in order to be able to really monitor well, you have to know where your, your test points are. In the you know back when I was at Lockheed, if there was a problem with a printed circuit card or a multi layer board, we'd had test points on the boards, and you could go to those test points and perform a particular measurement to see if the health of that um, system was um, up to par. So you'd measure it, you could adjust it, and that sort of thing. But you had to go to those test points. Well, our large mission critical uh, networks have test points in them. If we take and document them and lay them out schematically so that you can see those test points, and that's how you know how to build your decision support metric systems is because you have good documentation and you can see it. Okay. Now, it's difficult to, to do this today because there's so much compartmentalization. So it's very difficult for the average technologist who's in a silo to actually go outside and look from desktop to server and all points in between and to, to, to look at that application. And there's been some uh, slowness to train people who understand uh, capabilities of the desktop servers, their network infrastructure, their SAN infrastructure, so that when there's problems that are uh, passing or getting their system's performance, they go and, and set up test points or maybe already designed test points to expertly monitor those various dependencies. And that includes mission-critical applications, your exchange servers, your mail systems, your Internet, and um, we could we could basically take a lot of reactive people and repurpose them to looking at monitoring tools and monitoring systems that would eventually obviate problems and reduce the amount of reactive workload and improve the performance and reliability. But there's a problem with documentation. There's a problem with good decision support metrics. And it's a holistic problem that doesn't change overnight. It's a cultural issue that starts with best practices and an intention to, to improve um, as you go through. And all of that's designed to help you recoup your monitoring tool um, investments. You have a lot invested in those monitoring tools. So you all want to focus on that user performance and, um, and go in and do you know, root cause diagnosis and... Um, and, and that all ties together with another topic that I'm going to talk about, and that is architecture ownership. Some of my customers are government contractors and large institutions that utilize um, outsourcing organizations, or perhaps you are an outsourcing organization, uh, or uh, perhaps you're a government entity and you have a lot of contractors, and those contractors are changing. Uh, one of the things that I like to encourage encourage you to do is to make sure that regardless of you know what's going on with your contracts and that sort of thing that you maintain architecture ownership that requires accurate technical documentation and um, you know to, to address that so I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit so that 
you know, you change contractors or a contract or um, have a different outsourcing organization or you're looking to outsource or maybe you're looking to insource change from outsourcing back to your own insourcing, you want to make sure that you don't have any um, uh, limitations by indispensable contractors, indispensable employees because you own your architecture. You own your system. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have a contractor perform your architecture ownership functions, but it probably needs to be separate from your regular operations so that it's more of an auditing function. Architecture ownership, what, what do we mean by that? Well, there's two components of it. One is to know yourself, and that is to, you know, uh, basically render your architecture architecture into diagrams so that you can um, see your environment, all your technologists can see your environment and understand it, and your architects can work around pieces of paper. Now, today, with our uh, lights out, uh, data centers, and that sort of thing, it's impossible to do this unless you have good documentation. Not only good documentation, Thematically you know, and of the configuration and that sort of thing, but also of your racks and that type of stuff, because you don't have and you don't want to have people in your data centers. You really want all that work to be done either online or virtually or from multiple locations. In order to accomplish that, uh, it's essential to have good system documentation. So what we believe that you need to do is pull all the router switch and server and configs out and basically put those on paper in a logical schematic type diagram. Uh, documentation needs to span multiple security zones and be scalable. You really want a diagram that's not the server guy's diagram, it's the network guy's diagram, it's not the storage area network guy's diagram, it's not the desktop people's diagram. Who's it? It's not the application diagram. Whose is it? It is your organization's diagram cross-silo. So it's to put together an end-to-end -end diagram with all the pertinent detailed information so you can put your finger on where an end user is connected that's getting poor performance, and you can move your finger through virtual circuits and that sort of thing all the way through so that you can find the logical and physical. So if you have a bad switch port somewhere, if you have... Of course, you've got redundant systems, right? Redundant systems can sometimes be a problem because you may have a bad fiber on one of those redundant connections. But it's flipping back and forth. Therefore, you have an intermittency. And it does work, but when it works, it works in a degraded state, and then it flips back and forth between the two. So anyway, it's kind of important to uh, be able to view your system um, up so you can you can see everything. Um, another part of our architecture ownership is that I have noticed that there are literally sometimes hundreds of people who are in the IT organization who, if you really quiz them and ask them, they don't have a clue of where they fit in the organization technically. So it might be a server person, it might be a network person, it might be a desktop person, it might be a virtual person, it might be the person who takes care of the SAN or the WAN or what have you. You know, those people need to understand in the end. So you have a really good document that depicts your environment, then you can take that document and you can train all of the people with, here's our architecture, this is why we do it, this way. Here's how it works. Here are the tools and systems that we use to manage it. And then you bring all of these people who um, previously you know, might have been hiding under their desk when there was a problem. You bring them out because you've enabled them to now understand their environment. And you have you know, your network uh, rendered so that you can see it. And now you train people. And what we believe that you need to do is, is train people your architecture, your systems, your monitoring tools, your capabilities, your organization, your trouble ticket system, so your technologists banging on all eight cylinders. 
So instead of having five or six people in your entire organization that are really, you know, um, you know, into it and understanding everything, you bring it up to several hundred through training. And what we believe that you should do is have a certification program for your architecture. So first you document it, and then you train everyone on it, and you test them and certify that they truly understand before you give them the keys to your Active Directory, before you give them the passwords for the routers and switches and platforms. They go through this orientation and certification on your particular architecture so that they're not, not trying to make it look like where they came from, rather bearing a hand to help you continue to build your architecture and your system. So architecture ownership is a very, very important component. Now, problem and change management. Change management, of course, is essential uh, to, you know, one, diagnose root cause, but also to enable rapid, continuous system performance optimization. Um, in, in doing root cause, analysis, of course, that's my area of expertise, and that's where I get called in a great deal. You know, we come in, we diagnose the problem, and and then uh, we do root cause analysis, and usually it's had to escalate quite a bit before people finally say, hey, let's get the in here to help us solve this problem. You know, we have smart people, we have, you know, capable people, but they're busy doing other things. Let's bring somebody in to focus on this, and we come in, and we help with that with that solution. One of the things that we do when we do health checks is to check out your trouble tickets and find out what's been uh, pervasively causing problems and if we can um, basically prioritize those bad trouble tickets and then go mitigate the problems, the root cause of those problems, and basically obviate future trouble tickets, which lowers your cost of you know your help deck and that sort of thing, and some organizations are so reactive that they keep hiring more and more help desk people to be basically customer interface folks, be, and, and that just keeps growing, and growing uh, so large and so wide that you can see the curvature of the earth in those cubicle areas where the help desk is, and you know it, it makes a lot of sense to basically mitigate those um, particular problems. Uh, through uh, statistic analysis and then root cause analysis. So, you know, the, the first thing that you need to do is you need to do um, a problem statement. You know, you need to know what your problems are. You need to engineer your system documentation, perform macro and macro analysis. Macro analysis is using your decision support tools to find out where the problem is. And analysis is getting down to the packet level to diagnose the problem. So that's another thing that you need. And in order to get to critical problem resolution and have a really good organization, you not only have to have the macro analysis, SNMP tools, no tools, performance management tools, but you also need the, to, the ability to go down to the micro level with packet level analysis. Another thing that's helpful, if you have a lot of applications, and you're finding that you're having to go out and diagnose problems a lot uh, where applications and your applications are being said, you know, that are slow, if, if you basically embed into your application development a, a, an early and frequent deep packet performance analysis um, and, and then subsequent design of the monitoring system to look at those application vital signs, that will yield incredible ROI for you. So it's our recommendation that you have regularly embedded deep packet inspection early in your development cycles and redevelopment refreshing cycles so that rather than waiting and, and putting an application out there, spending $20 million on new new hardware refresh and software refresh and that sort of thing, and then you go to roll it out, it's got so many SOAs, it's got so many different interfaces with other systems that when you turn it all on and you start using it, you find out that the end user won't use it because it's so abysmally slow because there was no performance analysis done in a micro fashion incrementally over the period of time. So you need to, to look at doing um, uh, application analysis 
early in your cycle. Some of the things that you can do is, you know, identify your dependencies, do micro and macro um, analysis, and do uh, latency analysis on your web, your SAN, your cloud, your metalware, your load balancers, firewalls. Find out where your problems are early on, and that will help you with those decision support metrics, be able to uh, design metrics to watch those areas that you know in the future as you scale might become a problem. In uh, business technology integration, you know, like I said, you know, a lot of technologists and 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 um, technology managers are finding that you know they're in a silo and they can't really, you know, they've got operations, they've got engineering uh, for each different uh, type of technology. And it's hard to get an end-to-end -end view of the entire system. So we've come up with some way. We believe that you build virtual teams um, to, to basically have representative of each silo, um, you know, for your architecture ship, for your problem management, for each one of those. And if you put them on a team together, you can end up, you know, having a collaborative design environment where all your silos are working together. You can have documentation that's, that is end to end from the client all the way to the server, the application, and all the various systems in between, and you can really get some traction in there. And that, that is dependent upon a master plan. Uh, and a master plan uh, is, is a prerequisite for collaborative design. You have to know what your objectives are. And so we we like to um, focus you under business technology integration in, in master plan development so that you document the is and then help migrate toward that future. This is our cross-silo collaboration mod model. Um, it is uh, essentially a in which you visualize all of your various organizations and all your various silos, cloud, um, your network, your desktop, all these different things. And these folks, security and platform, and you basically build out an architecture ownership group, a business technology and master plan development group, an application development optimization. And these are virtual teams. You don't have to change your, your logical organization or your budgeting silos. You just need to put this together so that you have the glue to help everybody understand one another's environment um, in a team uh, sort of way. So in all, all of that stuff up into your is master plan, and then you've got your way ahead, your future master plan, so that you know where it is that you're headed. So these are things that you can do. Architecture ownership, decision support metrics, business technology integration, master plan development, um, silo optimization, problem change management, application development optimization. Really good things that can be in your forefront. Remember, take a look at that Jefferson Memorial and remember that each one of those pillars and each one of those steps are steps to uh, your user's uh, best interest. But along the way, Appalytics can help you. Appalytics is dedicated to crisis avoidance through integration of best practices. Our TS is our technical services where we'll come in and help you with existing problems. Our S is our assessment services where we can come in and help you identify the risks and then help you develop mitigation, uh, mitigation strategies. And then finally, our cornerstone services which help integrate and obviate problems through the expert integration of best practices. So I appreciate you joining me today. Uh, we appreciate you, you uh, spending your time with us. I hope it's been uh, useful to you. And if there's anything that I can do to help you or if you have any questions about this presentation, just go ahead and email me, bill at appalytics.com. I appreciate your help um, in, um, in building out our industry, uh, uh, helping us all grow and understand uh, what we should be doing. So Appalytics. Applicant Analytics Software and Services. We're at your service. We appreciate you and your joining us today. Take care.